This is just a quick follow-up video that I'll probably make as a response to Blogrich. He's responding to MSM's 1876's video on the uh, Bible inerrancy. MSM is kind of saying, well, what does it matter if the Bible is inerrant? It's not going to, you know, the fact that Christ really died for our sins is already a historical fact, la la la. Um, but it does matter if the Bible is inerrant. Because if it's not inerrant, then it's not from God. Or God didn't preserve it. And there are a whole lot of people out there who are trying to destroy the Bible, like the King James only people. So it is a major doctrine. It is core to the fact of the Bible being from God. And so it has to be dealt with. Now, MSM is basically saying, look, my faith is so strong, I'm sure Christ died for my sins. I don't care if the Bible has a mistake in it. And I, I empathize with his position, and I like him a bunch, okay? But at the same time, it is actually core to the Bible's own statements itself. It says, thus says the Lord. This word came from the Lord. Every Bible writer knows that he was writing the word of God down. And they use different, um, what do you want to call it, benchmarks or phrases to tell you that they're getting it from God. Because why should you pay attention to the Bible at all if it isn't from God? If the Bible isn't from God, you know, then maybe you should be reading a different holy book. See? So it does matter. It's core to, well, does God exist? Well, yeah, you can just look up in the sky and know that God exists. But which one? See? The question, which God? There's so many versions of God out there. It's mind-boggling. So you've got to be able to find a holy book of some kind that proves it came from whoever's the real God. You know, will the real God please stand up? Okay, that being said, this is his video on it, and these are the comments. And the reason I'm taking you here is that for the first time, I may never get this right again because I'm such an idiot. For the first time, I was able to explain what Bible meter is in one in two simple posts okay I'll never be able to do this as a face video so I'm trying to do it here lol your grandma was right Bible meter this is the purpose of Bible meter why my life is dedicated to it now Bible meter tells us when the text was written and I give one example here but every single Bible text is gonna have a little metered phrase tell, telling you when it's written so we got to, you know, everybody's got to retool, all the denominations got to retool and go back and find out what this meter is and when the books were written. That will end a lot of debate over the Bible. Okay, everybody's debating, well, when were these books written? Okay, well, but if the Bible has a meter that tells you when it was written, and I give the example of the, the dateline that uh, John uses in Revelation, 58 years after Christ died, Christ died in 33 AD according to, you know, uh, well, no, uh, 30, 30 AD. Um, 84 years after Judea became a province, okay, Judea became a province in 6 AD. 126 years after Mary was born and Herod became, it's not necessarily Tetrarch, but it was, you know, the beginning of his rule, which was 40 BC, okay? So this is all 91 AD. 58 plus 30, uh, 31 really, because it was the beginning of the Jewish year, 84 plus 6, and 126 plus 40 BC. It's a date line, and it's metered in Revelation 1, 1 through 3. The same thing is true in Isaiah 1, 1. He's writing 42 years after, um, I forget what the name of the king was that he was under. I want to say it was Uzziah. Psalm 93 is written 63 sevens after Israel went into slavery, and that's a special kind of calculation I go through in my Psalm 90 videos. Isaiah 52, 13 is written 42 years after Isaiah became a minister to God, you know, a prophet. In other words, this passage is written 42 years after this passage, and both use 42 in order to tag each other. Daniel 9, 4, and 5 is written... Um, 49 years after the temple went down, that's part of his meter, and then 73 sevens after Psalm 90. That's the other date line that he uses in the second verse, in, in verse 5. Ephesians 1-4 is written when Christ would have been 56. 
okay? And I wouldn't know that thing about Ephesians if it wasn't for an argument I had with 1689 Baptist. So God used the argument I had with him to, to make me understand that Ephesians 1 was metered. My pastor didn't know it was metered, but everything my pastor taught is in the meter. So of course, you know, God's interested in, you know, validating the pastors he gave correct doctrine to. And so that's how come I know. I'm just a, you know, librarian. But a librarian can add up syllables. So it doesn't matter that I'm a woman. That's been my big hickey with God. So I've been saying, look, I'm a woman. Why don't you give this to a man? Okay, but if he gave it to a man, then the man would have to be spending his time on secretarial work. So he gives it to a woman, so then the man can look at what the secretary did and save time. So that's why I got it. All right, so then there's other things. The meter also cross-references other Bible passages. Let me just put all this on screen so you can pause the video and read the comment instead of listening to me. Meter also tells us how the writers cross-referenced other Bible passages. I go through that in the Ephesians playlist, the GGS 11, and in Psalm 90 playlist. I show you how the, they use the meter to cross-reference other Bible passages. Okay? So that's their concordance. That's their method of using a concordance. Well, that's real important to hermeneutics. Okay? I mean, this is valid, really earth-shattering stuff of importance to hermeneutics, all of it. It's not Bible codes. It's their way of counting syllables to reference other Bibles, other Bible passages. And they all do it. Okay? I've only, you know, put on video four Bible passages, five Bible passages. No, six. But, you know, it's all over the Bible. I'm not going to live long enough to, to do all the meter. Okay? And here's the thing that's most important to MSM's video. The first purpose of meter is to verify that you memorize scripture correctly. See, they had to memorize it. They didn't, they, they didn't want to carry around all those huge scrolls on which the scripture was then written. So they just memorized it and said, instead, and they used syllable counts to verify that they memorized the scripture correctly. Okay, and then you also use the syllable counts, which you already previously memorized, to prove that the words were copied correctly. This is their own way of auditing scripture. In other words, if it's the word of God and it's inerrant, then you got to copy it right. And it turns out, you know, the Molar scroll is, you know, supposedly has lacuna in Isaiah 53. Well, there aren't any. The BHS text is perfect, and I show that in my Isaiah 53 video, where you can see the meter patterns that Isaiah is using. And they're doctrinally pregnant, and it's a timeline from first David to last David. That's how the meter works. See, there are no words missing. So, one of the problems about the inerrant argument is, oh, there are words missing. Well, in one copy, words might be missing, because it wasn't copied right. But in the other one, no words are missing. And you can tell that by the meter. Okay? So inerrancy does exist in the Bible. We just have to know how to find it. So that's the purpose of the Bible meter. That's why I make so many boring videos, if you ever wondered why. You know, I, uh, this stumbled, I stumbled onto this back in 2008 with Isaiah, Isaiah 53 in particular, because I was trying to verify whether we had all the right words in the Hebrew, and I was trying to account for why the LXX text is so different um, from the Hebrew, and it turns out that the LXX is an elaborative translation. In other words, it's explaining the Hebrew, not merely translating it which they do a lot in the LXX. Okay, that's a style other scholars know about that. But I didn't know about that. So I thought, well, it looks like he's writing in some kind of poetic cadence. So what's that cadence? Because I have a thing about rhymes. And meter doesn't necessarily have to rhyme, but it does have a particular structure. The structure is every seven syllables, um, not necessarily every seven, but when the writer aligns his words such that it comes out to a paragraph divisible by seven. That first time he does that is a date line. And then every other time after that he's tying to other passages in the Bible or making new points. And he's also tying it to a timeline of Bible dates. Okay? See? It tells us when the text is written, but it also does a timeline, a historical timeline from Adam which is what I'm making those videos now in Patu, the Patu playlist, shows how Paul is reconciling time from Adam 
using meter, the anaphora, meter. So, you know, if you wonder, well, why is Brain not making so many boring videos on the, on the meter? Answer is I have to. I'm the only one on the planet who knows how this meter works right now. And I don't know when I'm going to die. You know, so the rest of my life is going to be spent on this meter, and it's a secretarial function. I'm not important. A five-year-old kid learned this meter. Mary and Paul and Zacharias and Daniel, they all cite this meter off the top of their head. They must have learned it when they were kids because they're all talking off the top of their head in meter. So it was something you learned as a kid when you were Jewish. Now, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if Jews today even learn it the same way, but the Sephardic pronunciation of scripture and their metering today is not like the Bible's. So I don't know how they learn it today. But, um, you know, this whole business with syllable counting is still important to the Jews, so you should be able to verify at least some of what I'm saying with the Jews. Okay, you can't find this in Christendom. Christendom is still arguing over whether the Bible has meter, all right, in Hebrew. But Hebrew meter is used in Greek in the New Testament by Mary, Zacharias, Paul, and John, and I'm sure others, I just haven't found them yet. And it's all over the Old Testament. Every time I stumble across some passage like Deuteronomy 32, probably Psalm 23, um, probably most of the Psalms, Psalm 110, um, Psalm 37 and 26 just came to mind. I don't know if they're metered. But see, it's all over the Bible. We need to get into this. This will help establish the inerrancy of Scripture and help us understand the Bible better. So that's why I do it. Signing off.